Okay, we're going to do another watermill scene with um, spring foliage. I, I, I liked the my last scene, but um, I wanted more impact on an intensity level um, with uh, this next scene. Now, I'm going to do this on a paper. It's not matte. They call it doll. And I don't know. It's just this paper that I got years and years ago. It wasn't a known paper or anything like that. I just like the feel of it um, when I was in the paper store. Um, but I would say it's a little bit closer to matte, so it's a, it's a coated somewhere in between matte and glossy, but I'd say it's much closer to the matte, um, matte surface um, kind of finish on, on, the, uh, on the card, okay? Now, I, I'm just using it because I just happen to uh, I don't know, I didn't have any more uh, glossy half-page <laughs> cut, and I haven't used this uh, um, dull uh, paper in a while. And I'll list it down in the, uh, in the uh, description section in terms of the, uh, the brand. Uh, let me see, it was Appleton Papers, and I heard it's out of business like so many other paper companies that were around, you know, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago or what, something like that. A lot of uh, those paper companies have come and gone, just like so many other um, companies uh, of that sort from those days. Okay, I'm inking it up this in black. Now I have a lot of black ink on here because I just re-inked it. Anytime I'm using um, a non-glossy surface, I usually like to ink up my, uh, my pad a little bit more just to compensate for um, some, some potential um, irregularities. And I was mentioning to someone recently that was having troubles um, getting um, good impressions in the center of her stamps. I just said put a stack of paper magazine or newspaper underneath and that'll help compensate for the uh, irregularities in, in your table, surface area, etc. And uh, she wrote back and she said, yeah, that helped a lot. So anyways, I have a lot of um, paper underneath. Okay, now I'm going to stack this. I've never used this water mill at the top of a, a waterfall like this before, but I've seen um, pictures where um, there's water mills set up right on the edge of a uh, waterfalls, and I thought that was really cool. So I thought I'd try it here. I don't even know the number of times I've used this water mill with um, on a half page scene. I'll have to go back and check out the uh, stamp module. All right. So, anyways, that is stacked right up there. We have a waterfall coming down. Now, one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to get a lot more intensity in the uh, um, the spring foliage that we're going to use in here. So I need to figure out some sort of compositional format to have an excuse for a lot of extra trees in here. Okay. This is the boulders with light lichen stamp. I'm going to, I'm going to stamp it right down here at the base of the fall, okay? To give that um, something to uh, connect it with the outside edge. And I'm just thinking about this tree right here, the tree cluster right in here, okay? And what I'm going to do is we'll mask off this bottom portion right here, okay? And I'm going to stamp this right in here, like about like so, okay? Very little masking is ever needed with Stampscape stamps um, for a very good reason, which is I don't feel like fiddling around with that type of thing, so I designed my stamps where, you know, just very little masking is needed to make a nice continuous um, composition where it's nice and seamless and you cannot tell, hopefully, where one image ends and the next one begins. And that makes for a 
in my book, that makes for a, a really good stamp, something that I don't have to fiddle around with a lot. Okay, now, this I'm going to put some of these trees in here. I want more of this um, spring types of foliage, okay? So, um, what I'm thinking about is, what color am I going to do these trees? I want them fairly dark because it has to match this heavy, you know, black ink for the rest of the composition, but... These, are, these trees are going to be, a lot of it's going to be pink, so I'm going to run some pink inherently in the impressions themselves, okay? I could do that in black and just color those other areas um, pink, but eh, I want to give myself a little bit of a head start in terms of the utilization of that hue. I'm going to mask off this rock right here. Under mask it a little bit, have a little bit of it showing, maybe a quarter inch or so. And then what we'll do is we'll add these trees in here. The reason why I don't want these tree trunks to be coming right out of that, you know, that rock, so I want them behind the rock, so you just cover that rock up. Okay. Alright, so we have something like that. It's kind of a brownish magenta almost. Okay, and we'll do the same thing, dark brown, there's a pink, um, this is not an alcohol pen, this is a, uh, a watercolor pen, it's the Marvy uh, 1600 series, I'm guessing it's 25 years old, so they give you <laughs> quite um, a lot of use, okay. I'm stacking these trees. See how that kind of just builds up those trees right behind there. All right. So let's let's vary it a little bit too. Okay. Let me go with the uh, tree cluster small. I use the tree cluster large over here. I don't know. That's like a big shape. You can't even see it anymore hardly. And I'll mix some green onto. This is like an olive um, brown right here. That's literally uh, the name of the color right here. So black and the little scumbling, you know, marks of uh, olive green, olive brown, sorry. Um, and I'll mask off the tops of those trees. Do you see where I have some of it showing like that? I don't have it all the way up here. I have it down a little bit. That way I don't get this big um, type of uh, kind of halo at the top of the... Uh, the trees. If I get a little bit of it, it's not going to matter because we're going to be coloring on a lot anyway. All right, so see how that kind of intersperses that tree with this one? I could put maybe another one over here. And we don't need to fiddle too much around, you know, this type of thing. I, you know, if I'm just using a small portion of this, I don't think I'm going to take my time to, you know, put in some green in there. So, again, under masking and just get some of these trees right here in the corner. You just kind of keep building it up. And one of the things about landscape stamping, the reason, a lot of people say, I make it look easy, okay, when I do it. And I do make it look easy because it is easy. The thing, here's the thing, though. Here's why a lot of it looks easy, and it is easy, okay? It's because I'm overlapping everything in here, okay? Most types of stamping... There's a lot of outline designs that are not tonal, okay? They're, you know, if it's a tree, it looks like, you know, like, you know, the, the center, that's a horrible tree, <laughs> a trunk like that, where you can't overlap them because you're going to have lines going into each other like that, right? So people avoid the merger of imagery. Well, in my designs here, the way that I've drawn them, all Stampscape stamps, is they're tonal, so, and I've really taken into consideration the edges and the transition zones of a stamp so that you can just overlap and overlap and overlap, you know. I mean, that's a jumble right there, but it's, they're all supposed to merge in with one another. Or, you know, you can stamp it out individually, and it can be a very defined stamp, 
or you can combine it very easily, and that's what we want. We don't want to have to do a lot of fiddling around with things, and I do some other tricks, you know, to avoid having to uh, do a lot of masking around buildings and things like that. Okay, so, coming in like so. I mean, this is easy masking right here, and it's because we always want to under mask and we want things to merge we want things to overlap and blend in with one another all right so see all that foliage in there that'll give me a lot of opportunity for a lot of pink um, blossoming um, hue uh, color okay let's see um, I wanted more pink uh, in my scene from, from the last one that I did. So let's do another, uh, or create some other additional opportunity. Let's go with another one of these. We have this area down here, which would, you know, kind of create this um, a pool of uh, water. But let's do this right here. Let's stamp this on an angle like so. Okay. <laughs> I'm just looking at that. I, I don't stamp on this dull paper very often, so it's kind of a, a little bit of a different surface for me. I, I really like using... Yeah, I need to get around to it again. I haven't used my uh, hybrid inks in a while, but I need to do some of that pretty soon because that is really fun stuff to work with. I almost feel like I'm painting with those uh, hybrid style inks. But I like using the hybrid style inks on this um, matte or dull paper. It just, you know, it's not as sealed off as uh, glossy, so I can get a little bit more uh, of uh, texture and application with those, uh, with that media on uh, a little bit closer to a matte paper. Or, you know, if I did use a matte paper, that's uh, good as well. All right, so adding these trees in here. Okay, so see that's going to provide me with an opportunity for some more of that pink right here. So I, I'm really going quite crazy with this because, you know, I just didn't use enough of it um, on my previous scene. I, I was a little bit too conservative with it, um, with this color. And then I, I did a bunch of background trees that were very faint, so I couldn't go with a real bright pink in there. Okay, wiping off the bottom of this one, I'm going to, tra going to transition this one. So wiping off quite a bit off the bottom, almost everything. And then as I move up, about midway up the stamp, I have about, I've taken off about half the ink, okay? So that's going from wet to dry, and when I stamp it out, it should stamp out dark to light. Take off a little bit more than you think you'll need. You know, sometimes I don't take off enough and it's really dark down here anyway. Okay, and let's transition. Now, the re I'll show you why I'm transitioning it like this. Okay, see when I transition it a little bit like that, see how it goes a little bit darker up here and it's faded out right here? Well, as it's going into this tree, I want that tree to show a little bit more right in here, the silhouette of it than having that real dark against it in the background. I, got, I could have taken off a little bit more too, I think. But that'll be okay. Okay, so I think I've given myself a pretty good opportunity. Oh, uh, here, one more thing. I just noticed this little speck right here. You can just use it as a filler. Just use your boulders with lichen again. See how, you know, all the stamps are nice and universal. I'm stamping over that image up there. I'm stamping over this image. I'm going over this one probably by a half inch. But it just kind of fills in that area right in here. Okay? Now here's the trick about this again, too. I make it look easy because sometimes in my layout like this, after stamping out my composition, it still, you know, it might not look good in certain areas, okay, especially. But, and if it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because of all the um, color you're going to bring into this anyway. It practically doesn't matter um, 
you know, those, the little things at least. Um, I don't know, like right down here I stamped. Some of that tree soaked through and got on the rooftop right there. Who cares? You know, that, those little types of things aren't going to matter. This didn't merge in perfectly, but I'm going to tone all this in anyway, so it doesn't... Again, those types of things just don't matter. So, I don't know. Uh, well, I guess the bottom line as I'm getting at is you don't really have to, th you know, worry about those types of issues um, with whatever type of media you use on here. Okay, so... Uh, work with it, you know, and uh, kind of see it through a little bit more. Give it a chance, you know. Um, let's see here. Let's use a few different colors, base layer coats. Let's go in with um, some antique linen. All right, a lot of you have the Distress Inks, I know. So maybe you have the entire collection or any color that they ever come out with. Um, and it's not a bad line to do that with, that's for sure. But I like to use some really light ones. So antique linen, um, yeah, what was that other one? Something, something, oh, tea, tea something. You know, just any light color, okay? This gives yourself a really good base layer, okay? And I'm just going to go in and fill in. Now, here's the thing. When you add your colors in, think about coloring, but also think about one extra thing, which is lighting, okay? So think about how light falls, okay? Now, in my imagery, most of it, I make it with top lighting is kind of mostly, you know, considered, all right? So on the sides, the vertical edges of this mill, I've made them darker. I've put a few more dots you know, especially like right here to the front, there's a heavier concentration of dots right there because it's darker, okay? So we can see the volumes. So see here what I'm doing? As I'm coloring that area, I just have a, dry, you know, paper towel and I'm coloring it. Now see, doesn't it look like you can see the side of this mill a little bit more dimensionally like that? So, or like underneath this um, water, I don't know, whatever you call it, trough or whatever, um, maybe underneath there in the shadows, what you do is you make those areas a little bit darker like that. Okay. You see that underneath there, there's a little bit more shadows. I mean, this is just with one color. You can do this with all kinds of colors or multiple colors too. Let's get some of this on these rocks as well. Okay. See the darker area of the waterfall. Okay. You can add a little bit more of that to those areas. And this is a really light tone. I can put it over everything, really, if I wanted to. See, this is where all of your image images start to blend and merge. And you give a lot of continuity to all of the separate imagery that has been stamped out in your stamp sketch or layout or whatever you want to call it. So, like I said, if there's little th issues kind of here and there um, within your composition, your initial layout, you know, it comes together in the end. You just have to give it some time. This one looked fine, but with this extra coloring and shading, it sh should look a little bit better. Watch this down here on this rock, okay? Adding this in like so. If I color the whole thing in, I'm coloring, okay? But if I leave some areas lighter, you're lighting as well. You're adding color for the purpose of lighting. So it's a little bit more strategic, but all it does is just entails is just leaving some areas light like that. So just don't color in everything as if it was like an outline space that's to be colored in completely neutral. Everyone is so... Um, kind of uh, enamored with um, the idea of filling in something and leaving no streaks or anything like that. I get it, you know, you, maybe you don't like that, but I'm someone that likes texture and, you know, texture and art is, you know, one of the visual um, aspects of, you know, um, range and diversity within a given surface, you, you know, and to have some texture in there, I, I love it, you know. 
and uh, for things like pens and alcohol pens or whatever, if you can kind of, there's a spirit to those types of, um, that type of media. And uh, if you can have marker marks and gesture in those marks, I, I like that I, personally. I think, um, you know, when it's, when there's zero textures, you might as well just cut like, cut out like a piece of paper that's nice and flat, you know, everything has to be completely flat. But, you know, if you're working with uh, media and you're doing things by hand, I appreciate kind of the uh, certain aspects that show that it's been, something has been made by hand, you know, the gesture of the artist and the maker is in that spirit of the mark and application. So that being said, the reason why this is easy for me is because well, I don't try to fight against um, certain types of uh, um, natural aspects of my medium. I utilize that um, strategically uh, for the purpose of the piece. Okay, now see how I'm kind of adding this in here. That water is going, I'm going to make that blue in there. But having that base layer coat of that little, really light, warmer tone like that, um, kind of sets a nice uh, foundation. And I, I, I leave these striations in here, you know, so, you know, when we're doing something like this, you know, going back to what I was just talking about, um, texture and contrasts and, uh, you know, the kind of the hand of the maker in here. Naturally, this is going to be, if I'm putting, I'm applying color in streaks, why not have it streaky like that? Where there's areas that are left light like that, doesn't it look like lighting now instead of just flat coloring? There's more dimension and variation to it. Okay, all right, so. That was easy stuff. That's just one color right there. Uh, antique linen. All right. Now, one of the things that this paper, I do like kind of the flatter paper sometimes. Um, it's for the, uh, the purpose of applications of things like gel pens and alcohol pens. Sometimes those can be really fun on a paper that's not glossy and so sealed off that I'm, you know, typically working in. Okay, so this is Memento Summer Sky. If you have a, a tumbled glass, that would be the equivalent, okay? So something light blue, so I'm sticking with my lighter tones initially, okay? Look how beautiful that is right there. It's a much richer tone than just going with blue up there, in my opinion. Not that just only blues, you know, don't look good, but suddenly we have this variation here of warm and cool tones. And you can get away with that, um, especially when you're working with very, very light tones. You can just come into those areas and you can merge you know, even like complementary colors, colors that are on the complete opposite from one another on the color wheel. Um, you can do warm over cool, like in this case. Um, and it, it's just all good. It just, everything merges in really well. So see that down there? But see how it's still a little bit streaky, right? Okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, okay, let's go with the Bahama blue. I was kind of debating on whether or not I wanted to use that. Let's use it a little bit. Ooh, that's a lot darker. Kind of blend it in. Use a lighter touch when app applying it. Okay, something like that. I'll keep it a little bit streakier in the background like that. Let's bring it down here into the water as well. I like to uh, mirror a lot of uh, what's going on in the sky down in my water. You know, in my water scenes just to bring a sense of continuity to it. Okay. Now this right here is a little bit darker than what I wanted, but 
I have that white pigment ink that I'm going to be doing all in the scene, so I don't even worry about that, right? You know, it could, you know, it's it's a weakness right now, but it'll be a strength, I think, once I add the, uh, the white pigment ink in there, because I'll have something nice and bright that I can control underneath my uh, white pigment ink. Okay. All right. Now see this, when I'm doing these spring types of um, scenes with this uh, pink foliage, I really enjoy using um, my alcohol pens and uh, sometimes some uh, degrees of application that I normally don't do on uh, a lot of times on glossy cardstock. Browns, pinks like that. You can use blue in here, whatever you want to color the rocks. Here's the thing too, okay? I build up my colors from light tones into darker ones. By the way, these are Marvy and Shuttle Art pens. These pen right here probably cost me 40 cents each or something like that in the 80 set, okay? Going in and coloring my deciduous trees. This maple pear is all deciduous, but the um, tree cluster that I was using before has a uh, has uh, the deciduous tree is flanked by uh, the evergreens. So see, I can color that one pink where it exists in this design right here, and that's right here. Something I, I, I don't know. I almost kind of it's camouflage right in here. So I can kind of see it a little bit. Okay, now here's the thing about this, too. I mean, you could go... I'm using a very light pink right now. You can color in that entire tree. Or you can kind of just color, the, you know, some of it. Um, like right here. You can see where there's highlights on the tops of my trees like that. So sometimes I'd be cut, coloring down here, but I can leave the top part lighter. Like it's capturing the light. So if you do all that type of thing, like you color the base of the rocks darker, leave the top of them lighter base of the uh, tree branches darker, leave the top of them lighter, then what you're doing is just overall, you're creating this overall lighting continuity saying, okay, the lighting is coming from, you know, up there above. But this is just the, the first color so far, so um, yeah, let's see, I've got these ones down here too. I can color this in using um, dye based inks too with a sponge applicator, but, you know, if you have the pens, they are very convenient for getting into those kind of harder to reach areas. Okay, I'm not going to be really be able to blend these in, you know, so much as this is not, uh, this isn't like Yupo paper, or, uh, like glossy cardstock where this is going to move around too much. So as I get darker, like this, you know, this one's a little bit darker, um, you know, if I don't want certain areas to be real dark, then I won't use as much. But I have a secret weapon, too, because I have the um, uh, paint pens that I'll be using in here. And those are lighter than these pinks that I'm applying in here, so I can bring my light back into it if I need to, if I've overcolored something. Or I just want some additional tone. Okay, here's one thing. Let me go back to that lighter pink in here. I'm going to put, make it look as though there's some pink foliage behind those trees that are inherent in the watermill stamp. So see this right here? Let's we'll color this whole back area right in here like that, okay? I wanted more pink in my uh, scene to really kind of... Uh, emphasize that, um, you know, that aspect of the, uh, I don't know, time of year, season, whatever. I'll kind of add a little bit of variation back here. There was no, you know, that maple pear didn't stamp back here, so I'm just kind of adding some kind of amorphic um, touches back here. Okay, let's go in here. I'm going to have to remember everywhere I've 
stamp these pink ones. Okay, something like that. Okay, what do we have here? Well, let's check this one. I always kind of check out and see what you're using. That one's much brighter than that one, right? Okay, so kind of know what you're getting into. This one's uh, fuchsia. This one's the Marty one. Okay, now this is what I wanted, though. I, I, I was a little bit... I like how my last scene came out, and I, I colored it as pink as it should look, probably. But I want to just do it again, much brighter. I wanted more, you know, more of that pink impact. Yeah, it should be uh, the title of this one. <laughs> Coming around, we're getting a little bit pinker and pinker, huh? It's starting to go kind of overboard in terms of what I want the final piece to look like. But again, here's the thing. I have other th steps coming in this process, okay? These areas are going to be lighter and duller with the uh, techniques, techniques that I'll be using on here, the media that I'll be applying on here. So I'm going a little bit more or a lot more than what I think is ideal for the scene, okay? Okay, so, okay, let's get into this. Let's make this wood a little bit more aged. Okay, let's see. It's kind of a peach looking tone. Let's go ahead and color some of that right there. Let's get underneath the eaves of the mill, right? I can see it on the design, it's darker in those darker areas, okay, and on these boards, some of these planks, what you do is you kind of go with the direction of the wood, like that, okay, I mean this is still one of the lighter tones that I'm going to be using, so, so it kind of it's a little bit more irregular, you want it looking real weathered looking. It's not a like a pristine brand new mill or something like that. You want it to look aged, so you have to kind of give a little bit of an antiqued look. Okay, that was like a real peach color. We have biscuit and coffee and brownish gray here. Okay. I'm kind of working it from a light tone and incrementally darker. Okay. Yeah, this one's not very dark at all. A little bit of a tone on the rooftop, like that. I wanted to get a little bit browner looking. Let's see here what I have. Sepia. Okay. SCP is working out pretty good. Okay. This one looks really dark. I don't know if I'm going to use too much of coffee. Okay. Maybe in the shadows. One of my uh, illustration instructors said often the brightest tones are in the shadows. It's a little bit too bright for me, so I'll kind of blend it out a little bit. Eh, it blends pretty good, actually. I wasn't quite sure how deep set that was going to be. All right, I think I'm going to tone in this um, this brickwork right here. Okay, make it a little bit darker. Okay, I'm gonna put a little bit of a 
marks right on the rooftop as well. Okay, how's that look? Gives it a little bit of character, huh? A little bit of weathering. I don't know, there's quite a few colors brought into that. Several, I don't know, what, six? Oh, I forgot the wheel here. A little bit of tone on that. Okay, something like that. But you see there's variations on here. And I think that gives it that kind of nice weathered feel. I'm using mostly light colors, so... Um, you know, like I said, it, you can, when you do that, you can really experiment. You can blend over things. You can use your blending one tool if you want to. Yeah, the blender, for those that don't know, it's just this clear, nothing fluid. Um, uh, pen, just to, you know, for the purpose of blending your different colors together. Okay. Huh. Maybe I'll bring some of this brown into, you know, this tan into some of these trees. It brings a little bit of continuity between this and over here, right? When you use common colors. Like that. Okay. And this one's a little bit of more of a warmer tinge. Okay. Let's go back to that other one. Um, if I could find it. I have so many pens here. Um, here we go. Brownish gray. Yeah, brownish gray. Let's go into this, some of these areas over here. In the shadow areas, maybe. And bring some of this brownish gray into those trees, okay? I get it. brings a little continuity into the overall scene. And the brownish gray actually would look kind of good on these waterfalls, too. Now this is another thing that I wanted to do on my previous scene. I wanted to bring a little bit more um, kind of hand coloring, uh, you know, marker coloring into that one. But I, I didn't. I just I handled a lot of it with the paper towel um, coloring. And then by the time I got around to the pens, I didn't really didn't need to do too much. So. See how I'm kind of coloring, but I'm leaving some of it, like these rocks. See, I'll do the side of it, but I'll leave the top a little bit lighter like that. And then maybe we can blend that together a little bit more. Okay, so you just take that and blend that darker tone in. But again, kind of don't, you know, utilize um, the, the blender to um, not tone everything out still retain some of those lighter areas uh, within the piece. Okay. It's still, I mean, to me, this is still looking a little bit, um, oh, I guess a little bit ragged. <laughs> I don't know of any other word. But again, it's, it's with that, you know, the white pigmenting, it's the white paint pens, everything else. I just see this as kind of like a foundation for doing a lot of those other types of uh, media techniques on here. It just kind of brings everything together, so I'm not even worried about it. Okay, this is a kind of a darker bluish gray, so I'm kind of adding some of this down into my shadow areas of these rocks, We're bringing in a little bit more um, shading and dimension and opacity these things. In other words, um, when you stamp, you know, stamp onto a piece of paper, the piece of paper is showing through, of course. So I'm just kind of fleshing in, you know, these objects on here and making them seem a little bit more dimensional. Three-dimensional, I guess. And the darker tones are being used. Um, 
kind of at the base of objects. Okay, here's some little bit more of this blue. Let's go into and get some, you know, real specific areas with our water. Okay. I don't want it stark, you know, white in there. I like a little bit of blue on my rocks as well. So you just kind of go in and fumble it around in here. Here's, here's what you have to do, though. Here's where, you know, the people kind of have a harder time doing it. When they're doing it, when they're just doing these little types of things like this, it's easy to really color out everything again, but try to retain some of those lighter areas, you know, here and there. You don't have to do it everywhere, okay? But try to do it in a few places, and it, like I said, it'll bring a nice sense of lighting um, into, a, into a scene. Okay, now let's hit this. Let's go back to our paper towel. And, uh, I mean, you can do this with pens, too. I think it's a little bit faster with, um, paper towel like this and just in this kind of blending process right here. But let's really kind of add some shading, okay? Now I'm kind of wiping this down to get, you know, kind of a smooth consistency on this. And then you can tell right here. See this right here? That's what I want right there. You know, something nice and smooth, okay? I mean, I, need to, I might have taken off too much here. But you kind of get, what this feels like is it, it almost feels like you're applying like a like you've taken the this paper towel and rubbed it in some charcoal, and then you're kind of toning that in. See, it's just that real light shade of it, and that's where it's easy too. Okay, I never apply too much because there's so little coming off of this, and I'm using a light touch on here too. Okay, so this right here, you know, you can. Kind of bring in a little bit of shading like that into this area like that. Okay, so this area down here, it's, these rocks aren't really anchored into the scene, so I'm anchoring them in a little bit more, see, at the base of the rocks, right? And then see this? You just kind of blend it in like that, okay? It's like powder, think of your, so you're applying like, a, I don't know, like a charcoal in your transitioning it out here into the darker areas. Okay, you can tone in some rocks right in here. You were bringing in a little bit more opacity to the rocks because you're making them darker. They look like they're a little bit more dimensional now too, like that, right? Let's do a little bit around here. Now here's, you know, this type of thing with um, kind of your, you know, your own artistic you know, direction here. If you want something like those waterfalls to stand out more, all you have to do is you take the area around them and you make it a little bit darker like that. So see that really stands out a little bit more, okay? Let's give this uh, water mill a little bit more dimension. You know, the darker areas on the side of it. You know, in the shadows, I can add a little bit of tone. So it gives it a little bit more dimension. There's more of a three-dimensional kind of feeling um, to the uh, to the watermill. If I kind of darken it in a little bit like that, maybe it'll feel like it's sitting in the scene a little bit more. Doesn't it? See that area down here? I've toned it in. Doesn't it feel like it has a little bit more visual weight to it? You know, you want to get. It's giving it a little bit of substance. Okay, a little bit more lighting under the eaves. I can just put a little bit of tone underneath that right there, and look how much that roof kind of stands out a little bit more, right? Okay, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, you can do all kinds of things like that. It's it's never ending. You know, the possibilities. But here's the thing. I just kind of do a little bit at a time, right? And it barely shows. It's just, I'm adding this right there. And that's hardly anything. It's like a 5% gray or something like that, see? And when you do things like that, just don't rush it, you know? A lot of people think, okay, I'm using black. And they want to see this, right? Now, that's harder to control the amount that you use than if you do this, okay? So that's all, you know, that's all it is. And it's not like it takes forever. 
I think that takes forever if you've got something you don't like laid down, then you have to kind of undo it, you know, it takes a little bit you know, more time to kind of undo something than just to never have it down there in the first place. So kind of just control your applications and you'll be fine. Um, and just get your tones down through repetition, you know, like I, all my pens right here, I've used kind of the lighter versions of it, and I built them to the darker versions, but I then, see, I can get exactly what I'm going after when I do it that way. Yeah, and like I said, I'm working through a very light tone right here, but what if this took like 10 seconds to get that tone down there, but look how round those rocks look. Rocks, a well darned rock should always look three-dimensional. Okay, there's a lot of rock designs I've seen out there in the industry that it's more of a caricature of a rock. It's like an outline with hardly any, there's no texture or volume to it, okay? You want a rock with good texture and volume to it and character so that when you go into it and just with very little effort you can get this three-dimensional real rounded form. The reason why rocks are often kind of the foundation, you know, it's, you know, that's the saying, you're my rock, you know, you want that to be really kind of substantial and it sets the tone for something like that. We know that these trees and everything like that are safe because of those, you know, the foundation that it's on. It's not just going to wash away like a, like a see-through, you know, um, object that has no visual weight to it. All right, so that being said, that was all fun stuff. Coloring, who doesn't like coloring? You know, we all love coloring. Kind of takes us back to childhood and crayons and kind of the best times and, uh, I don't know, school, right? The art lessons. Okay, so I have Sharpie water-based extra fine pink and lavender. Then I have my meows and white acrylic paint pen. Okay. There's a, I don't know, dozens of these types for sale on uh, Amazon is where I got this one. Um, and I think I've mentioned this every time I use it. I think they're all the same. They look all the same to me, but there's like a different, you know, kind of labeling on them. I think they're all coming, or I don't know, half of them are coming out of the same uh, factory somewhere, wherever they make them. I think they make them in China, I'm sure. Is that where these ones are made too? I don't know. Sharpie. Um, but anyways, here's what I was saying about um, not worrying about certain types of aspects of... Uh, let me go a little bit brighter over here. This pink over here is a little bit dull. Okay. Not worrying about certain things if you overcolor with, you know, one color or another. If you have kind of media like this, it doesn't matter. Then it really doesn't matter. When I go to the next step after this one with the uh, white paint, uh, white uh, um, pigment ink. I can't think of it using so much media on this one. Okay, so anyways, I'm going in here, and what I'm doing is, here's what I'll be doing. Um, you see these lighter areas on tops of the tree? If I've colored it in with a darker color than this pink, what I'm doing is I'm going back in, and I'm adding these dots back into these lighter areas so that it looks like a real dimensional um, tree that's kind of top lit. And I'll do the same thing with the... Uh, the the white pen too. Now this pink shows up a lot if I'm putting it over a dark area, okay? Where you put it over an area that's the same value as pink, it doesn't really show up, it just reads as kind of pink. Okay. But this is giving texture and color lighting in some instances. Like I said, where it covers up a darker area, it reads as light. Okay, 
Let's see if we can see it at all. Hey, can you see all these little pink little dots? I put some over my rocks. Here, we'll do the same thing over here. This pink won't show up as much over here because I think this is all lighter. But I do want it up there. I really love this type of look. Yeah, it's one dot at a time, but I don't know. It only took like a few seconds. I don't think it took a minute over there with that pen, but it can make a big difference. It kind of it gives a certain shimmer of lighting into an area with color, okay? And we have these areas down here. This is where it'll probably really show up, I think. And this set, I don't know where I bought it. I think I bought it at a Michaels or something like that. But uh, this set of extra fine Sharpie um, paint pens comes in a set of uh, the pastel colors. So it came with green, kind of a beige, warm beige, uh, blue, the lavender one, which I have here. And how many was that? I don't remember. Green, blue, beige, lavender, pink. Yeah, five. I think it came with five. I don't think there, was, there wasn't really a yellow. Which wouldn't be bad as a color. Okay, over here. Okay, now here's the thing right here, too. What I like doing in this type of scenarios. I, I put these pink little clusters on things. I put them on rocks here and there. It's not to color the rocks pink, but it's just, it shows that there's um, these little blossoms. They're just kind of getting all over the place. Kind of in a good way, right? It's very subtle because the pink in many cases is the same value as the background, so it just becomes this pink dot that's kind of um, blended in with the uh, the surrounding color. So it's just going for a little bit of a, a change in hue. So let me see if I can show you where I put it on these rocks right here. See, it's on those. Put a bunch right here, here. It's right in here where it doesn't really show up very well, right? That's where this pink is the same value as in the back of it. It shows up a little bit more where it's, you know, you're, you're applying it over a dark area. Okay. And here it is all over this area down here. Maybe I'd put a few more down here because, you know, this is supposed to represent the foreground, so maybe you'd be able to see kind of those little details like little um, blossoms on top of a rock uh, much more distinctly. Okay, so that was that. Let's move along. Let's not take too much time. This is the lavender. So, if there's kind of a pinkish tone, maybe, you know, there'll be a little bit of a darker one as well, which would kind of be more of a lavender. I won't do too much of this one. Let's go to white. Love doing the uh, little white um, effects in here. Always shake these up before I use them, even if I used them like yesterday. Okay. Okay. The white really kind of uh, brings out um, some of the highlighting parts. So on this one right here, because it is lighter to begin with, I will use it like on the top of those branches, you know, to make it look like lighting. You know, in, d in addition to being a little blossom too.
Yeah, this is coming out a little bit more like it. I, I wanted more of that prominence of that uh, pink hue in this. I'd say the last one was more the mill with the spring blossoms was more about the mill. On this one, I don't know. I, I'd say these blossoms are at least an equal character, um, you know, to the uh, to the watermill. You know, maybe more. I mean, it, it's, it's you know, there's some really bright pink in here, so these little blossoms, um, you know, they might be the star of the scene here. Putting little, like these little white petals here and there. Find the you know the wheel a little bit in a couple areas. You know, there's some of these planks coming out. So you can kind of put the you know you can put in more additional texture into your you know, your wood or your tiles, roof. You know, there's these little fancy type of things around the mill. Redefining some of these edges of these rocks. We put some into the water like this. So a lot of people's inclination is to just color in water blue, okay? But where water is kind of churning and things like that, I, I like to bring a lot of variation into it. Not all the time, but most of the time. I think it it just it creates a nice visual passageway into the scene. Okay. That is fun stuff. I'd highly recommend it um, <laughs> as a technique. Um, lighting and texture and whatnot. Okay, so this is some Hero Hues Unicorn White. I have just a, your standard cotton ball here, and when I say cotton, I would really recommend going with a straight cotton, 100% cotton, okay? Um, I don't know if they make a fusion one, but the acrylic ones just, they just don't work. I can't get them to work. They're real kind of blobby, okay? When I put this onto a cotton ball, you know, this one's, I've already used this one before, so it's a little bit smashed and condensed. There's ink in the back of that, you know, and that's what I want. Kind of blot it off a little bit, and we're going to add this where light meets dark. Okay, and that'll be all over the scene, okay? See this? And you kind of taper it off. You start it kind of heavier in the lighter area, okay? Then you taper it off. You don't want it real heavy out here, okay? So you kind of transition it a little bit. So kind of apply in the light, maybe with a little bit of heavier hand than you barely touch and you're kind of feathering it out like this, okay? So transition it, okay? It's just like applying color, but now you're applying lighting, but you're doing it in a very controlled manner again, because you're not just going, you know, straight right here, right into there, you know? You kind of tap it off a little bit first, and then you use a very light touch in your application process.
Okay, see what that's doing? Isn't it kind of adding kind of a nice essence to the scene? Doesn't it feel more kinesthetic, you know? There's, there's moisture in there. You can feel it. You can see it, you know? You can see it, but you can kind of feel, you know, that mist in there. It's kind of like a visual, you know, it's a visual texture. It's soft, but we know what that represents, you know, you're at Niagara Falls or something like that, you know, you can have a lot of churning water. If you're at the grist mill, <laughs> which is, um, this one's uh, kind of a, my version of, I altered it though, to better suit the needs of the stamper, but you know, at the base of a waterfall and whatnot, um, you can really give it that nice essence like that. Okay. This is one of those things, as far as saying too. Um, I can't tell you how many times this technique right here saves me from things that I did, you know, or in the course of, uh, you know, the composition or coloring process that kind of went a little awry, you know. But this kind of brings it all together, like this one right here. It was too strong of a application of that blue, so I just go in there and I just knock it down like that, you know, with some of this pigment ink, and all's good, you know. It's not really an issue anymore. All right, okay. All right, let's see, at the base of a waterfall like that, it's certainly one really fun application of this, creating mist and churning waters and atmosphere. Let's add a little bit of lighting up here, okay? Okay, so in the lighter areas, it's a little bit darker up here and then it kind of transitions, right? It goes from darker to lighter. Let's use this. Remember, I kind of wiped off the bottom of this stamp right here. So it goes lighter, so let's make it even lighter like that. And let's have some of that atmospheric mist in the background like that. See that lighting back there now? Kind of makes the mill stand out a little bit more. Let's add some of it right here. Some of this lighting is just like, it's like creeping over the, uh, the trees right there now, isn't it? Right up there. See that illumination? You can see how it looks on the overall, doesn't it? changed kind of the spirit of that area and then of the scene overall. This area in here, I can bring in some of that lighting. I don't know how this would look if I go real dark out there, you know, this might kind of stand out looking weird, you know, because you're just changing the, uh, the contrast so much, but this one right here, I'm just, you know, you're just kind of altering it a little bit. But look at that, doesn't that light look like it's just kind of creeping over those uh, trees in the background? and into the scene. It's like liquid light. Okay, I like that up here. Let's put it over a, there was a little portion up there of white in the sky where I didn't tone it in. So let's, let's put that background tree kind of bathed in light like that. Okay, look at that. If you go too much, you can always just wipe it off and you know, it should come off. Well, let's, let me show you. Okay, see that right there? Right? It didn't all come off completely, but let's reapply it. I, I like it back there. I just wanted to show you that you can take it off. Let's put a little bit of this mist right in here too. You kind of oscillate it though. Don't put. I wouldn't put it over everything. Well, I did. I did it years ago on a scene that I just didn't like at all anywhere. So I put it over everything and it looked better. 
but on something like this I feel that it looks best when you oscillate it okay put a little here a little there have it nothing in between so that the contrast play off uh, one another okay if there's no contrast anywhere it's just it's a little bit more one-dimensional it can look good though but um, you know there's not very much variation okay see that I'm kind of adding that throughout that area see that right in here but then it's crisp here I'm doing like a like a midnight scene of a sleepy hollow or something like that maybe it looked good if you did it all over everything but if you're gonna do that you better make everything kind of a lot darker you know to begin with you know because you're just going to be toning it all out and you know you might be covering it up with this and if it's too light to begin with then you'll lose all the forms in the background okay so now see these trees right down here see how crisp they are in relation to that maybe you know I mean I think it looks good just like that maybe you can contrast you know crisp against diffuse back there but I think I want a little bit of that up here too so I'm going to just on the tops of these trees put a little bit of that light down there and look at that doesn't it look f nice and kind of like it's glowing in that light remember where light meets dark okay and then transition see this I'm kind of moving it you know tap 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 into it one of the things you might notice if you do this enough is as you apply this and as this pigmenting dries it becomes much darker it's not as light as when you first applied it so you have to kind of go over it and go over it and go over it you know to get it exactly where you want it to go or if you just know that you just kind of apply more than what looks you think looks good and then when it dries you know it might be the um, the value you know that you want you know of lightness okay so I like kind of obscuring this you notice I put tone over it and you know darker tone like black but then I put white over it and it all kind of balances off out in the end all right so that is that this is a lot of fun I really highly recommend it <laughs> okay here's my dr. Martin's bleed proof white isn't it is an opaque white watercolor paint okay you have to kind of reconstitute it every time you use it but I just used it yesterday so or two days ago I think it so it dries out in here it's a very fast drying media but you just add water to it and it just goes right back into liquid form and you just need to kind of mix a little bit off the top and let's go in here and let's add some um, splashing water down here okay this is old toothbrush as you can see I've soft off a lot you know on the side of my jar so I don't get a big drip on this okay I don't hold this but I'm doing it for the sake of the, uh, the video here okay and then you just kind of see I'm not just going zip I'm just kind of releasing a couple hairs of the toothbrush at a time it's giving me that splashy varied splash look all right down there let's go up here you see that texture in there it's all splashed all over in there see that I mean that is really fun stuff I like even doing it over the whole thing like this okay let's put some additional splashing I don't know it's like it's like blossoms in the uh, air you know when you do it like this It'd be cool if I I mean I could put a few more dots like that in pink but okay 
Let's do it down here too. Let's do it in the water, why not? I'll hold this up for you, you know, so you can see what, what this looks like. Okay, that, I don't know, each technique gets uh, more funner and funner. I don't like that, I like that big splash right up there in the sky, so I'm just going to wipe that right off, no problem, right? Okay, let's see if we can see it. I don't know if you can see it too much. Yeah, you can see where that splashes across the, uh, the water mill, but I like it, you know. You see all that little white dot? Some of it's the meows and white paint pen, but... See how that's splashing down there? I mean, I could add all that in, you know, with that white paint pen too, but it's just more varied. There's some big, small little dots in here like that. See that right in there? And here. But let's look at it. See, like that. I mean, it's not like, you know, we're looking at it and saying, man, that, look at all that splashes all over the place. You know, it's more of a secondary type of thing if someone notices it at all. Okay, so let's add in some additional foreground, and we'll call this a scene. But this is kind of more of the spirit that I wanted um, yeah, my last one to, uh, you know, to look like. Uh, in terms of the, the vibrancy of the, uh, the pink, the prominence of the pink, I, I should say. Okay, so this is a uh, Sukaneko... Versifying black. All right. I want a nice dark impression with this, okay? And hmm. I'm going to come in like so. I didn't use too much of it, but it's just like that. I might put, you know, I'm going to put more of this too, but this oak branch has been designed to use different portions for what you want. If you want it kind of a heavier application, you can use, you know, the heavier side of it. And then this area down here is more lacy and see-through. So there's different portions for what you want. Some people use the whole branch, um, especially like on a, like embossing or something like that, and metallic embossing powders on dark papers a lot of times. That looks really fantastic. I use it mostly for different portions of what I want. Okay, I'm gonna have it up here as like an overhang. bit more dimension. See that right there? It adds a little bit more depth, I think, to the scene. I think it looked fine without it, too. Okay, to kind of balance off the uh, left and right side, I'll put it on the uh, right side as well. Yeah, I just used a tiny portion of it right there. I've seen that dark against the uh, uh, the light, near against far, kind of sharp against soft, you might say. Okay, and all right, this is my twisting leaves. I really like using. I haven't used this too much over the years, but I've been using it lately with, um, in conjunction with uh, the reed stamp, just for some, a little bit more variation um, in my foregrounds. Yeah, that's enough of that, maybe. Let's use the reeds large here.
I changed the angle, you know, of the reed so it doesn't look so picket fence-ish across the uh, front. You can use it higher, lower for variation, variety. Okay, see that right down there? I usually just use the reeds, but those uh, leaves make it a little bit more varied, I guess. Okay, I think that is it. A little bit more dreamy, I, I think, in this one. Well, I don't know, maybe that last one was because, it, you know, it was a little more kind of white. No, I think this one looks a little more dreamy. It's just that pink in there is a really nice, I don't know, it's friendly looking kind of ideal type of thing. I don't know what they're supposed to be. Cherry blossoms, I don't know, whatever type of blossoms, but... Okay, now that I'm adding in more of this, uh, I need to be careful around that Versafine because that's very wet and I don't want to get a bunch of black imprints, you know, by going into there and tapping in here, so just be careful about that. On this uh, matte-ish paper, it'll Versafine will dry pretty fast, though. Okay, but that is a fun scene. And, it, and like I said, it's more in the spirit of what I was thinking about uh, when I was doing that one a couple days ago. Maybe we can see that first one as like a you know, recital, or I mean a, a rehearsal for this final result. Okay. I don't know. It gives you a little pr practice too. You know, I think my the weathering of this mill is a little bit more complete too. Okay, let's take a look at this. You know, we can see this. There's a lot of dimension right up there, huh? I think the oak branch looks pretty good up there. I liked it kind of open too, but I think I like the branch a little bit better. Definitely with the branches around here, the oak branch and black, I think it really brings a lot more um, focus to that mill, you know, it kind of frames the scene off having this kind of perimeter application of that foliage. And it's given us extra depth. I mean, you can imagine this out of here, you know, I think that the waterfall is strong enough uh, in terms of an object without that, but I think this kind of brings a little bit more focus in here, you know, with this framing around it, there's a little bit more emphasis on that waterfall. Um, yeah, maybe I did cover up, you know, some of those pinks over here, but I think that's fine. You know, it's a little bit busy around here with that oak branch next to that pink. But I think overall, I think it adds overall to the, uh, the sense of the piece, just kind of adding that extra depth into here. So, um, hmm, yeah, that's the pink I wanted. So let's like, take a look at those textures in here. Um, See those textural little dots, you know, right in here with the violet, or the, the lavender, pink, and white dots in there. And that's really fun. And then we have this all splashed with that, you know, the Dr. Martin's bleed-proof white splatter paint. Look at all that dot out here. So when you look at it, it's really rich texturally. You can see all those dots in the background here, but it's not like it makes it so busy because this is like viewing it at arm's distance and those little dots don't, you know, I don't think clutter the piece, but I think it looks pretty good in terms of, uh, you know, adding that texture and upon closer inspection, the little types of details that um, kind of resonate and add up, you know, What is it? Their sum total is, uh, or their, the, I forget the saying, it's, uh, they're greater than the sum total of, uh, you know, the parts, the separate parts, so, yeah. All right, so that, anyways, yeah, it's good to get what you're, what you're going after <laughs> in, a, in a scene. So it just took me, uh, it took me one experiment before. So what I did in here was I added a lot more. My impressions were darker to begin with, which gave me um, kind of a greater leeway in coloring, you know, 
with darker, brighter tones of uh, pens, you know, by having those darker impressions to begin with. So a really strong, bright pink stamping, you know, stamping um, the maple pear out everywhere in there. Okay. All right. So anyway, blabbing on and on, I'm trying to think of what more to say, but I really uh, like the end result of this piece right here. The mill on top of the waterfall, I think, works pretty good. Um, and it kind of makes sense in terms of, uh, you know, a composition that, you know, you have something like that around moving water like that. And uh, I don't know, it was, there was very little um, kind of a, a paper towel, dye-based ink coloring. It was a lot to do with the, uh, the, uh, the markers this time and the, uh, the paint pens and whatnot. I think, what was there, like two or three colors right down here in the water and sky. So we're letting the, uh, the imagery itself kind of stand up a little bit more prominently by not having things um, kind of, you know, so um, kind of toned in and uh, vin, you know, I usually throw on this really strong vignette, but um, as textural as this is, I don't think it's a distraction in terms of the uh, being too busy, especially with the white pink, uh, of the white paint applied in there, kind of tends to mellow everything out. Otherwise, it would tend to vibrate with uh, so many textures throughout the place. But you throw that type of thing down there, and it just brings everything together, and uh, that's what I like so much about it plus the types of looks it can give um, in addition to it. It makes me look good, you know, with a very easy type of process. All right, so anyways, if you have any questions, drop me a note in the composition. If you like this video, I hope you'll hit the like button. And uh, thanks, as always, for tuning in to the channel.